everybody, this is This Week in Science. Our broadcast is live. <sighs> I'm back in the States, no longer world traveling. Justin is still in Vacaville. And Blair is not home yet. She's I thought she was. I was trying to find out all this mm -hmm. about how her, how her trip was. She's like, it's five months ago. I don't really know. <laughs> know. Like, what? Her, uh, your job just ended at the zoo, right, Blair? Yeah. Yesterday, or day before yesterday. No. It's my last day. It was so sad. Aww. So sad. Mm -hmm. Were they sad to see you go? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I kind we of like hope so. That they were sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can be invited back. That's right. For a real job. <laughs> that would be good. cool. Although I'd also take jobs other places like, you know, London. <laughs> yeah. It isn't I'm not I picky or anything. You've got a great zoo that you're already No, I, I love my zoo, but um I don't have a full time job there. Oh. Well, those bastards better get on the stick. Uh, yeah. yeah, you tell them. I will. Well, I can. I will tell them. They need to okay. really get okay. their priorities in line. Good. They're going to lose everybody's favorite zookeeper to another zoo. And that's good as can be. Well, we will be glad to see you come back because we've been sad that you've been gone, but we've gotten to see you every week, so you haven't really been gone. So That's true. Although, so we'll be glad you guys, that you'll come back. Did you have a show last week? No. Oh, yeah, we, we were going to tell you. Uh, we've been doing the show without you. You didn't have a show last week? Well, we, we had a ramble session. You had a ramble yeah. session. It's like an we, we, hour-long ramble. Talked. It, science came up, but it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like this, where it's going to be intense science through the whole So it wasn't hour. an episode of Twist. Not exactly. It was kind of. I mean, you can call it that, except it wasn't really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but it wasn't. I mean, you know, it was that, it's sort of like what the show was before it was a show. Kind of we just talked, and then like science came up a lot. Yeah, what it is, what it was, and what it shall be. Internet's come back to me. No, your internet's there. You're fine. No, it's not. We see you. You're not being able to browse things. Yeah, I can't see you. Makes me sad. Mm. All right, backup what? recording yeah. is up and running. Yay! And I'm going to squeeze and hit the record button on my end. Do, do, do. All right, everybody who's in the chat room, is everybody watching the show now? Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The broadcast is about to begin. Uh -oh. What was that? That was, uh... Is your computers uh, making noises? It's my telephones and computers. Uh, let's see. Who is blue? Blair's? Am I blue? Is Blair blue? Uh, I think I'm probably blue. I don't know how to fix it, though, because my stupid lighting is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks is like... My, uh, is my volume okay, everybody? Does, is everyone's volume, volume all right? Volume sounds good to me. Uh, yeah, Blair is blue. I appear to be orange. Uh, <laughs> we were, we're, we've been crayoned in. <laughs> okay, hold on. I might be able to Yay for me. fix this a little bit. I'm going to be right back. Coloring tonight. Oh, she went away. Okay, so I can continue, now that she's gone away, to put special musics oh, yeah, in... Yeah. We, have, we have surprise special music for Blair today. I do. Uh, thanks to Rebar. Looks like Rebar made special music. Not, Blair isn't listening yet because. Should I make it a surprise for everyone or should I just play it now? No, no don't play it now. She might come back. She might be. Okay, hold on. Then I will do we the add to library through iTunes. Jeez. Oh, 
my the forward lamp is here. It's just I'm not. It's something like the balance on the white didn't happen. That or I'm actually orange. Ah, I spent too long in the tanning machine. <laughs> Fell asleep and it came out orange. Oh, she's back. Okay. Shh, don't say anything, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to do a little ah. test really fast just to make sure I've got everything going well on this end. Can you disclaimer, hear this Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following hour of programming will corrupt you. <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Listeners should be wary and dripping. Can you guys hear it? I can't. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Could you guys hear the music? Yeah. You could? Yep. I almost thought it was me doing a disclaimer. <sighs> and then I was like, oh, wait, I'm not ready for it. I don't even. Internet. Why did this stuff confuse so me? I can't hear the music at all today. What is going on? Oh, I know. Darn it. Okay. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Did you hear that? Yep. Okay, good. I fixed it. it, 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 it. One little button. I have to have. There's so much complicated stuff here. It needs to be simplified, but it's not. Are we ready to do a show? I'm trying to work on the white balance a little bit here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where'd Blair go? Mm -hmm. We lost her completely. <laughs> Oh wow, that uh, fantastic tip, it worked. Look at that. Ooh, it's fixing. Very good advice, chat room. What did they tell you to do? Uh, let's see. Uh, where is it? Where, who's, who gave me the, oh yeah, uh, barbecue eyes. Sometimes a white piece of paper can help the automatic white balance. And indeed, it did. Indeed, it did. Success! Hmm. Okay, I'm back. Dun, 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 dun. And if you learned anything from today's show, remember! <laughs> Oh, Nart! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she, she missed the whole thing. Missed the whole show. She tuned out for a second, oh, must have fallen asleep, going. woke up, and it's sorry. Well, man, next week you'll be able to bring those stories. Actually, I have some stories from a couple weeks ago that I keep wanting to bring on the show. Okay. Good, good. Uh -huh. I have. I lost all the stories I found before. Actually, we, we should start a segment called "This Week in Old News." <laughs> we did. I do that every once in a while. Though. I'm like, we we, ha we always disclaimer it in mid telling mm -hmm. it. This isn't exactly this week, but I just found out about it. Yeah. It's this week in ago. last week's science. And we want to wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> oh, and Blair's back. Look at that. Hi, Blair. Yes, I'm back again. Wow, it took you a while this time. It was, uh, I think, a couple of months. Mm -hmm. It's a different, different background. Are you still in the same apartment? Yeah, so I had to move because our internet stopped working, so I'm stealing internet from next door, and it only oh. works right here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Living on the edge. All righty. <laughs> All righty. Unfortunately, this is not Skype. I wonder... I know with Skype, if things start going wonky with the uh, bandwidth, you can turn off video and just go audio. I don't know mm. if that's something you can do. I guess turn off your camera. 
I don't know. Mm, I guess I could do that. If, but we like, like seeing you, so unless it like... Like no, this. No, no, no. no, I'm a toad. Frog. <laughs> no, come back. Yeah. Although I guess um, if that, yeah, if the bandwidth is an issue, I guess that would be a pretty, pretty good fix. Uh, save a little bit of bandwidth. Just a little. No, oh yeah, I, I Strength want, says stop torrenting all those movies. I want the... I'm um, not right now torrenting <laughs> I want the Hypno Toad from Futurama on like an endless Hypno-toad. loop on my television. <laughs> okay. It's, it's 8 o'clock. I think it's time to start a show. Okay. Let's fit it right inside this hour. You ready, Justin? Ready. Ready, set, go. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. There are limits to our knowledge, but that limit is not the limit, as each new day brings new knowledge and expands the range, depth, and clarity of our knowing. We are on the edge of great new discoveries, but that edge is always there, sharply cutting new discoveries from the fabric of the whole universe. We stand upon the shoulders of giants, as the giants whose shoulders we stand upon once did, making it giants all the way down. And, if history is any indication, It will be giants all the way up as well. The moment for great things is always now, always this moment, always this day. And so without wasting another moment of the future, we bring you the greatest thing we could think of adding to this now, This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries. That happen every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? This week in science What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? This week in science Good science to you, Kirsten and Blair Good science to you too, Justin. Hey, it's good to see everybody. We've had a couple of weeks of break time, which has been a little, it's, it's been nice, but at the same time, it's felt like there's been a hole in my week. I miss my science. I know, I know, I've missed my science. So uh, let's get back to the science, right? Let's bring it have our conversation the way that we enjoy doing every week and we hope that everyone out there is going to enjoy being a part of it as well. Um, Let's see, this week, this week what do we have? I have some stories about bacteria, I have a story about, um, I'm looking at Blair's stories. Um, pruny hands. Mm, exciting. <laughs> um, worms and ears, and Ew, worms genes and ears. for worms and ears. Oh, and, and ears. Okay. <laughs> worms and ears. That's right. What do they have in common? And genes for cold. Hmm. For being able to withstand wearing shorts. Cold temperatures. Yeah. Justin, what did you bring? Ah, what did I bring? It's such a good question because I'd have to... Well, this is one actually that's already trending in a lot of places, so we might skip it. Uh, More information on homing pigeons. Oh, no, the homing pigeon one is actually very interesting. How do homing pigeons... I have something about homing pigeons. Find their way. Uh, Let's see. Don't steal my pigeon stories. All right, well, there's another pigeon story, but it's like an origin of pigeon, but that's a different one. You can do Uh, that. That's fine. That is a... (laughs) A new, a new type of uh, filter uh, for filtering the air using x-rays. Uh, do not try this at home. Uh, there is, in a way, uh, the ships uh, can become barnacle-free with the new material. It's kind of interesting. And there's a major brain drain going on in the United States, and it might not be because of what you think it is, but for some other... It's reason. aliens sucking it out of the, our <laughs> ears. Hungry aliens. <laughs> Yeah, remember when you, did you ever used to do that, when you grab somebody's head and, like, squeeze it and say, what's that? Mm-hmm. And people would say, I don't know, and you say, it's a brain sucker starving to death. 
Uh, that was one of my favorite mm. things growing up. But anyway, Blair, you brought homing pigeons, yes. and what I else? I did bring homing pigeons. It's kind of a continuing story for me. This will be the third or the fourth time we're going to talk about homing pigeons, so I wanted to bring that up. And the then next I, chapter in the lives of homing pigeons. That's right. Okay. Then, naturally, I have some invertebrate sex. And... <laughs> Yay! And, who, who knew? Um, who knew <laughs> that there was such, such a, a vibrant field of untapped invertebrate sex stories <laughs> out there that you've delved into now? I know. <laughs> and then I have a story about Pruny Hansons. We did have very lengthy discussion towards the beginning of my run on this show mm -hmm. about why our hands get pruny and we had this whole debate and there wasn't a yeah. whole lot of scientific research about it. So there's some research. It's interesting. Nice. Including I think one listener sending in a, a finger. Uh, At one point, yes. Yeah. It, was, it, Very. it wasn't a finger in a box, it was a, a picture of a finger. Yeah. Pictures of fingers. It was not interesting. An, not an actual, they didn't actually take a finger and <laughs> cut it off and right? send it to us. It was, yeah. <laughs> You hope not. Um, according to a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they weren't talking about fingers at all. They were talking about bacteria in the upper atmosphere. Researchers, senior author Constantinos Constantinidis, this has got to be one of my favorite researcher names mm -hmm. ever. That sounds uh, like a genius a, species. It does, right? <laughs> uh, he is a microbial genomicist at Georgia Tech. He and colleagues have published a study uh, where they collaborated with uh, NOAA and um, NASA to be able to collect samples of at atmospheric microbes. Um, they, I don't actually, I don't, I think I got that wrong. I don't know if they did collaborate with NOAA, but NASA definitely. So they. They used grip planes from uh, that are NASA's planes to collect air from one to ten kilometers above the ocean in August and September of 2010, and it was prior to and after hurricanes Carl and Earl. Anyway, they had these samples. They used DNA sequencing to uh, identify bacterial species that were in the samples. And they found that the composition of the communities differed from before to after the hurricanes, suggesting that hurricanes whip up bacteria, um, lifting them up from the ground or the, uh, over the, the ocean, from ocean water even, uh, and take them up to higher atmosphere. Um, so far, there have been suggestions that there are a few species of bacteria that are involved in precipitation and forming ice crystals that lead to precipitation. So uh, bacteria have genes that uh, collect water that can actually form, uh, help them become a little nugget around which droplets of water can form and then fall to earth in the form of rain. Uh, so they confirmed that they that there are these ice nucleating bacteria in the in the samples that they collected additionally they found uh, bacteria who had genes to be able to deal with cold temperatures and the environment that would be found in the higher and the upper troposphere so um, it's really fascinating they're looking at getting a better picture of who is living on around our planet and how little tiny microbes that we can't even see might be affecting things like uh, how our planet cools or warms because they f affect cloud formation um, it could be they could affect uh, global climate cycling there are so many downstream effects of microbes in the atmosphere that have never been considered really before that uh, are now really being actively looked at and it, this, I mean, can this be like, uh, can we pandemicify without even traveling around the world this way? Um, I mean, theoretically you could. I mean, there is, 
lots of evidence that we have uh, that there's dust from Saharan Africa that travels across the ocean uh, to uh, to the east coast um, to the east coast of North and South America um, there's uh, you know and in that dust you could have there could be disease causing bacteria there could be virus particles but um, the likelihood that they would really that those kinds of bacteria would really uh, survive such a trip the uh, I would I would guess I would hypothesize that there are certain bacteria that have genes that affect their survival allowing them to to survive better in the air to survive better the hot and the cold and the extremes that they probably encounter um, as they go from low altitude to a very high altitude there's a huge change in pressure that takes and place temperature um, they, it gets progressively colder and, and colder and colder and colder as you go up, right. up, up. Right, so not all bacteria are going to be able to survive that, and not even all viruses are going to be able to survive that. So, you know, the possibility that there could be some kind of pandemic that's born on the dust, sure, it's a possibility, but I would think that it's not as like, not very likely. Not as good a delivery tool as a good old fashioned human being. Sneezing, yeah. Touching things. Yeah, so I guess the big question now that we know that these bacteria are surviving, they have genes to help them survive, and uh, that actually uh, allow them to initiate ice crystallization, forming uh, forming ice and, and precipitation. Um, now that we that now that that's much more confirmed, the question is whether or not they are metabolically active. So when they're up at those really high altitudes, are they dormant, or is there stuff going on? Are they actually living and this is just what they do? Is this just the way that they live their lives? Wow. Now that's an environment. That's a, I mean, a free-floating, then that changes when we don't even have to look for life on, like, we could look at, for life in gas clouds, just about. Right. Wow. Yeah, and the, I don't know, I, I start thinking going on the, in the direction of, um, uh, terraforming, so basically using technology to change our planet. So people are talking about dumping iron in massive quantities into the oceans. Well, if we figure out what bacteria work and how they uh, how they form clouds and how they influence that, if we needed to have more clouds in a particular area to block sunlight from hitting our planet, could we seed the atmosphere with bacteria, Ooh, shoot gosh, big that bacteria so bombs into the sky? Ooh, I know, gosh. but is it possible? Yeah. Well, it'd be one but of those things like, like, you know, okay, um, we need some more clouds over central California. So we put up a bunch of clouds in central California. <clears throat> Suddenly there's rainstorms and floods in Nevada because <laughs> the clouds are moving out to, to go somewhere else and then Hey, weather. Weather. Once you start fiddling right. with the weather, then it's who knows what the ramifications are. Yeah. Yeah. Just guys, stop touching weather. everything. <laughs> stop. <laughs> you stop don't need to do that. Keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Leave everything alone. <laughs> So says Blair. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Oh, I'm wacky today. All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a story, Justin. Okay, so uh, looking this is, for one. No, this is the device. This is the uh, air air cleaner, which which we uh, may be may be able to use uh, against clouds someday. New device called a soft X-ray electrostatic precipitator protected immunocompromised mice from airborne pathogenic viruses, bacteria, uh, ultrafine particles, and allergens, according to a paper published online ahead of the print, the journal, uh, journal Applied and Environmental Microbiology. This device, known for short as SXCESP, 
is highly versatile with multiple potential uses, and Washington University is working on licensing this technology. So small particles are difficult to remove, and our device overcomes that barrier, says Pratham Biswas of Washington University. The device not only captures particles with a high level of efficiency that has never before been achieved, but also inactivates them. Uh, even bioterror agents are blocked and completely inactive. Hmm, says Biswas. Range of potential uses include indoor protection of susceptible uh, populations such as people with respiratory illnesses, inhalation-induced allergies, young children, picturing the bubble boy. Uh, protection of buildings from bioterror attacks, protection of individuals in hospitals. The one I'm thinking I'm not seeing here is perhaps even uh, some of these some of the new nano materials that we're working with, making laboratories safer, that sort of thing. Uh, protection for clean rooms and semiconductor fabrication. So removal of ultrafine particles in power plants too. So it's going to be capturing exhaust, right? So this could be pretty, uh, pretty interesting. It works by placing a charge on the particles, uh, which Biswas claims it does very effectively, and then using an electrical field then trap the particles. So forget the sort of size filtering like uh, you know, HEPA filters and that sort of thing where you're basically creating a smaller and smaller net and forcing air through something to attempt to capture. Uh, this is charging all the particles and just collecting them with a big magnet. Uh, the so SX... Using them as ions, yeah, basically like ion collection, yeah. static electricity. Yeah. It, it then also completely inactivates biological particles by irradiating them, photonizing them, <laughs> as UV light does, only more energetically with a soft X-ray. Hmm. Hmm. So that I don't know how. <clears throat> I don't know how. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty brilliant idea. That would be kind of a nice thing to to see get into get into production. I worry about the part of the x-ray portion of it. Having any, any even a soft x-ray seems like it might be... Don't you need like... But why would that be a problem? Well, don't you need like a little bit at least of radioactive material to produce the x-rays? Yeah, yeah, usually, yes. Okay. That's the only downside to it. I mean, it's a great idea, except uh, everybody's got just a little bit of plutonium up in the ventilation duct. It just seems like scary but it might be perfectly safe. yeah well I mean now but they're not irradiating I mean if it's in there for creating the x-ray that's fine they're not irradiating people necessarily yeah. so you're not gonna get you're not getting x-rayed and even so now x-rays are so low dose yeah. um, you know that they're 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 pretty safe but, it, but um, if you think about this on the in, in terms of the yeah the in terms of just the one use. I mean, the bioterror attack. I mean, that the thing has to be everywhere. Like you don't know where it's what's getting attacked beforehand or anything like that. But for the emissions uh, of you know factories, vehicles, of whatever you know that's producing carbons, could this be yet another silver bullet to reducing uh, the carbon output of mankind? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, it would definitely help. And uh, Schnago in the chat room is saying, haven't ion filters been around for decades and aren't they inefficient? So I would, yes, they have been around for a long time and uh, there have been retrofits to coal plants and all sorts of manufacturing plants to try and reduce the amount of uh, CO2 that's released as well as other, uh, other, other compounds. And yeah, they're, they're not 100%. They are not entirely efficient, but with... Like I'm, I'm guessing that with the way that they're designing this and the X-ray and um, everything, everything that it's going to become more efficient than those that have been built in the past. Uh, in the study, the device exceeded standards for high-efficiency articulate air filters, which must be capable of removing particles larger than 0.3 micrometers with 99.97% efficiency. Uh, it beat those mm -hmm. numbers. So, uh, sounds like they got down. Now, got it down. This is good. Yeah, they've been yeah. they've been working on the working on it incrementally for years, and you know we just keep it going, keep it going. Uh, people in the chat room are 
keep going on about uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. I guess Bill Gates is what is, what is it? Bill Gates says uh, polio is going to be eradicated in six years. Mm -hmm. So says Smith underscore. That's we hadn't eradicated crazy. polio, just in America, I guess. It was not, gone in America. Yeah, it's not. There are pockets of it. It's yeah, it's mm. still still around. Wow, I really thought we would have kicked oh. that one by now. Well, yeah. It, well, it's the kind of thing where you you have to be on it. Mm -hmm. Keep vaccinating. People you have to fly vaccines to far off places and convince people to take them the vaccines who might not want yeah. to. And yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Difficult. So anyway, I I like that story, Justin. But you know, I think it is time for. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Blair's oh, Lord. Oh, Warner. Wow. Rebar. Raybar. Rebar has given you your very own theme song. Oh, that's <laughs> adorable. Thanks, Rebar. Okay. So, I can't even <laughs> move on now. Oh, okay. Um, so, we should jump right into the invertebrate sex, don't we think? Yes? Yes. Of course. Uh, why? Why? Of course. Why wait? Why even ask? <laughs> Okay, so um, my first story is about wasps, and that uh, male wasps will tag females to kind of lay claim to mark their territory before they mate. So um, <clears throat> the team of biologists found that when a male targeted a female, he would approach from the left side, once in range, use the tip of his antenna to tap her antenna. Boop. And it would, it would put a specimen specific pheromone onto the female's antenna that marked the female as out of bounds. Or I marked tagged you, you're mine. or taken. Nobody wants sloppy seconds. I don't know. But essentially, they tag these females with their hormones. And once, <laughs> oh no! Wait, we'll just we'll just wait for her. She has to come back. She her mm -hmm. internet has dropped out for a moment, but I know she will be back. She will be back on her stolen internets. Here she comes. Ha! Ah. And I'm so sorry. have fun out there this summer, folks. Uh, we'll, we'll see you next Justin. week. Don't forget it's Darwin's birthday coming Talking up. Talking about something very important. It's funny. There's a comedian in Israel who says, um, his name is Benji Levitt, and he says that people love to blame Israel for the silliest things. Like, my internet goes out. I hate this country. <laughs> no, Israel's amazing. Anyway, um... So once the females were tagged, um, it kept non-tagging males from going up to those females altogether. Not to mention males who tagged the females were much quicker quarters, and the females were more receptive to the tagging males, which makes sense because if it monopolizes a female by tagging them, then that makes them a more genetically fit animal to pass on their genes. If they're going to monopolize a female, that guarantees that they'll have um, offspring. So that would be beneficial to the female that then her sons will be more likely to pass on their genes directly as well. So, so it's uh, beneficial to be, the female. You're going to be my girl from now on. No choice. Uh, that's just the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody else is even going to look at you. So I'm really I'm your only choice. Uh, but the good news is uh, when our kid grows up, uh, they'll likely be a jerk like me. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's it's actually well, called the sexy good. sun theory. It's the sexy sun the theory. Sexy sun? Um, yes, exactly. Because wow. they go for the sexy mate because they're more li likely to have sex.
sexy sons and sexy sons will be more likely to pass that female's genes. Let's see. A society. This is how sexual selection works. It's a whole woven basket of decisions and genes and selection. It's all very interesting. So you'd think the male is picking a female, but really in a lot of ways, the female is selecting out the males mm -hmm. who don't tag. Right. They're, uh, they're selecting for aggressive, possessive, uh, mm -hmm. sort of what in any other animal kingdom might be antisocial behavior. Uh, sort of like uh, what happens in New Jersey. Yes, yes. But as Beyonce says, <laughs> if you liked it, then you should have put a tag on it. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nice. It works. <laughs> All right. And then I wanted to talk about pigeons. Good. I've been waiting so, for this one. Yeah, so pigeons. Homing pigeons. They know where to go with amazing accuracy. For hundreds of years, people thought metal in their head. Magnetic fields, Magnetic for sure. beaks, right? But it wasn't. Magnetic brains, magnetic beats, beaks, all sorts of things, yes. And then recently they found out, no, it's not magnetic beaks or magnetic right. brains. But then they found that there were these little, maybe there was an iron core and some cells in their brain. Maybe that's how it works. Nope, that's not true. So the most recent development was, eh, we don't know. <laughs> But an interesting development with hobing pigeons, actually, they, they might have figured out the clue by looking at pigeons that get lost. Hmm. So what's wrong with these pigeons that the pigeons that can find their way home have? What's the difference? So there's some hobing pigeons that from specific sites at specific times always got lost. There were three specific sites that they could not find their way home from, ever. Except for in <laughs> one case, they did. So what they did is, <clears throat> this uh, this one guy, um, Wait, did we know Bill what this Keaton, site was? What was this from site? From Cornell. Was it airport? Was it a <laughs> no, it was in Jersey Hill and Castor Hill in the UK. So oh, the, the two hills, they look so much alike. Yes. I mean, yeah. Uh... Mm -hmm. yeah. So Bill Keaton from Cornell, um, he had heard a lecture many, many years ago that made him think back about uh, magnetic fields, but also infrasound. And hmm. he found that low frequency infrasound, which comes from minute vibrations in the planet's surface, he thought that maybe these homing pigeons could hear it. They could hear this distinctive low frequency lumber, lum, rumble coming from their home areas. No, and that sounds they would like making the evidence. Really? They would follow the sound. They would follow the sound to get home. Whoa. But what happened with these specific release sites was that there were there were some sort of environmental natural shield that diverted the sound so it was coming from the wrong direction. So he spent all this time studying meteorological conditions on the days of unsuccessful releases and then looked at it on the days of successful releases. And he reconstructed the atmospheric conditions and the kind of terrain and he found that the infrasound was refracted and came back from another direction. So, yeah. Whoa. So uh -huh. the whole world, the surface of the planet all the time is making these low rumbly things that are unique to the, the features and the yep, areas and areas yeah. and, and then we can't hear it and so we don't even know it's there, but the pigeons have GPS that can yep. tune them in. To, mm -hmm. Wow. And then on the one day mm. when they found their way correctly, he reconstructed those atmospheric conditions and it was perfect. The infrasound went right to the site. 
Huh. Whoa. Yes. So, so the in most likely they use carries them home. Yes. It's like a homing beacon yeah. calling them home. So really this is the, this is the most the recent are development. Surfing I, the infrasound waves. <laughs> Yes, exactly. They're surfing wanna, the sound waves. What do they sound like? I want to hear them. <laughs> I don't it's know, it's like that. the Maybe that's why I like the hypnotone <laughs> so much. It reminds me of my past incarnation as a pigeon. Yeah. But so I, like the, I think I like it. now it's time for us to do research with actual pigeons and reconstructed infrasound. We need to like raise some pigeons in, in one infrasound environment take them somewhere they've never been before and see if we can read, lead them to a place that they've never been before by playing this sound. I think that would be the only way for us to yeah. know for sure that this is how this is happening, is if you take them to an unfamiliar location and lead them to an unfamiliar location based on a sound they heard when they were being reared. And I, and I, and I also, I would have a crackpot theory to go it's along amazing. with that, which is to say... Cities put out a lot of uh, a lot of false uh, what, what, uh, the uh, uh, ultrasound whatever it is uh, things. That's why there's so many pigeons in San Francisco and New York. So mm. pigeons thought they were heading home. They just get lost. They're like, oh, in, I guess I'll just stay. Kept luring in more and more pigeons. <laughs> the sounds of the skyscrapers. Yeah. <laughs> but I, that's this is like really incredible. Um, I want this to be true. I actually want to. Figure out a way for them to like raise the volume and pitch shift it, and so I can really hear. Like Lance, I want to hear what my hometown sounds like. And then, and then, what if people are subtly uh, psychologically influenced by these influenced. these sounds right. in ways that we don't realize uh -huh. that makes people who live in New Jersey like the people who live in New Jersey, which I'm making fun of, but still, there's something different about you. It's New and, Jersey. Right? <laughs> Or, or uh, you know, other part, where maybe Southern California has, like, a really relaxing sound, man, and it's, like, where everybody's, like, kind of chill. Mm -hmm. right? Like, maybe there's... Did, this, did the story... Did the story talk about how, uh, how what the frequency of the infrasound was that they, that they were looking at? It did not identify the exact frequency. It was just very low, is all they said. Yeah, I just, uh, I just wonder about being able to... Uh, how, being able to sense something like that with the size of the ears and the head of the pigeons, you know the the wavelengths of infrasound are, are long. So you have um, a one hertz wavelength is three hundred thirty meters. Wow, that's very long. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> is it possible they have something so, other than their ears that would pick it up? How do you hear that? Yeah, so I mean, how do you sense that vibration mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. so long? Metal and, in their that's, brain? That's all I wonder, yeah. <laughs> no. We're back Metal in their brain, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> We're back to those little particles that don't yeah. exist, right? <laughs> right, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's quantum effects, everybody. It has to yes. do with quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. So wait, we're, are we, so wait, now I'm confused. That makes it sound like it's impossible. For these birds to be recording or tracking these really long sound waves and differentiating them from oh other really long sound waves that would be coming from other places. I think if it's the the question is if it's sound based or vibration based because I think it doesn't require right. ears to pick up on certain vibrations, so it's possible that so they could have, have a way. That's the. I mean, that's right. They'd have to like land and be like, put their well, bird ears to the know. ground. I don't know. I have a feeling that can't be true. That if you're really sensitive to it, vibrations you'd pick up on vibrations some other way. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know. Pigeons. Yeah. Not I, just rats I don't know. with this wings. Is just something I'm... Balls of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> balls, balls of mystery. <laughs> Welcome to Blair's Balls of Mystery. <laughs> Each week, we go exploring in search of 
<laughs> the truth. Oh boy. And, uh, <laughs> wow. I'm having a special morning. <laughs> you are. <laughs> and on that note, with mm. Blair's balls of mystery, <laughs> pigeons. Blair's balls of mystery. <laughs> Five pet, mill a pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Blair's Animal Corner. And oh, there's another one. I always forget to hit pause. I need oh. to turn off. Continuous play. Uh, anyway, we finished the first half of the show, everybody. Uh, I had one little, one little note to tell everybody about the Google Science Fair. If you know a uh, a student, somebody who might be interested in in checking this out, uh, Google Science Fair kicked off today. And oh, actually, yes. Is it yesterday or today? I think it kicked off today. Um, it's open to students between the ages of 13 to 18 from anywhere in the world to perform science experiments or create engineering projects and then submit them online for um, a grand prize of experiencing a week as an international particle, particle physicist, shadowing a physicist mentor at Fermi Lab, and then traveling with their mentor mentor to CERN. Whoa! Sounds, sounds pretty that exciting. That would be yeah, totally I kind rad. Of, yeah, I kind of want to go back in time <laughs> to be able, I mean, but then it would be back in time and it wouldn't be happening. And Anyway, yeah, go to I don't Google even know Science if there was an internet back then. Yeah, googlesciencefair.com is the website. <laughs> I don't think there was. <laughs> it was just barely. And, it's like a university thing. <laughs> yeah, gopher, pine, all those fun things. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that to everybody out there before we go to the break, because that's what it is time for. So if you are ready for me to tell you a few things, that's what's going to happen. We're going to go to some music. And then I will talk for a while. And then we'll come back with a lot more stories. Worms and ears, fingertips, other exciting stories. We'll see you after the break. <laughs> Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 titles in their library. They've got lots of books, lots of periodicals, podcasts, lots of things in their library for you to listen to. That's right. The idea is to be able to take your reading on the road, make it portable and easy for you to access whenever you need it. Audible.com is the leading provider of these books online and we are able to give you a free audiobook download through audible.com if you sign up for a trial with them today. So go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. It's audiblepodcast.com slash twist to get your free audiobook download today. Now. Additionally, we have, uh, have merchandise that is available uh, for sale. And if you go to strange noise and it disappears okay moving on <laughs> if you go to zazzle.com slash this week in science zazzle.com slash this week in science you will find a whole bunch of merchandise hats t-shirts cups Christmas ornaments, all that kind of stuff uh, that's emblazoned with the Twist logo so you can show off your support of our little podcast. 
and help us out at the same time. And if you don't like merchandise, you don't like all the tchotchke stuff, and you don't like having logos on all over you, all over you you can donate money. We do accept donations, and they are a wonderful way to keep us going. Your donations pay for our hosting, our bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, just about everything that we try to do comes from uh, your support through donations. We accept any amount, and we hopefully have made it very easy for you by providing PayPal buttons all over our website. So if you go to twist.org, and you go to uh, the most current episode, you can go to the bottom of the page, make some comments, check out the show notes, and look for the pink buttons that allow you to donate along the bottom of the page. Also, along the sidebar of the front page, there is a PayPal donation button there as well. Make it easy. PayPal, poke that button. Give us some money. We couldn't do this without you, and we really thank you for your support. I do pickups, I do deliveries, but my only fuel is ATB. I do pickups, I do deliveries, but my only fuel is ATB. I do pickups, I do deliveries, but my only fuel is ATB. And we're back. We are back with more This Week in Science for all of you out there. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Stick with us for the last half of it because we have a lot more to stick into the next 20 minutes. Justin, tell me a story. I don't hear you. Microphone. Microphone. I don't hear you. Okay. Okay. Can, uh, can, 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 okay. 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 So, there we go. Start over. So. So. Uh, Edit. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a brain drain taking place uh, in the United States, according to leading researchers. Uh, what would you think the cause of a massive brain drain in the sciences would be? Just a couple of postulations, a speculation, a guess. A cause of the massive brain drain. Um, limited funding in the United States. Ding, uh, ding, 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 ding. That was it. First answer. Stem Great cell job. research to other countries. No, no, you've already, you've already, <laughs> you've already won the prize. Uh, you have to leave the others in case. Winner, it's winner. Like, um, a nonprofit organization finds that uh, research worldwide to save sight and mind. Uh, it, well, today they released the released result of a survey of more than 170 leading biomedical scientists to explore the most significant barriers to progress in ending brain and eye diseases. The survey indicates that a lack of dependable funding is the major underlying threat, uh, creating deficit of highly skilled scientists at a time when the nation could soon face a health care crisis brought about by the dis, uh, devastating disorders like Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, glaucoma, baby boomers. Cures for these brain and eye diseases can be found if we give researchers the resources and tools they require, says Stacy Holler, president and chief executive officer of Bright Focus Foundation, uh, formerly named American Health Assistance Foundation. Nearly 20 million people in the United States are affected by Alzheimer's disease. Wow, that's a much... Much larger number than I would have guessed. Right. Currently, I mean, there's there are a lot oh, this of. Is a, it's a combination. Okay, it's Alzheimer's disease. More and more people. Yeah. So I was going to say, as more and more people become uh, get older, uh, we're going to have more and more people experiencing things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. You know, there are going to be all sorts of diseases that p start picking up. And 20 million is high for the number of people with Alzheimer's. It's it's uh, Alzheimer's, macular degeneration and uh, glaucoma combined is that 20 million. So that's, the number is climbing with the aging population as you just stated. Uh, yeah, this, it's, okay, so the new survey taps into the attitudes and opinions of these 170 top brain and eye disease scientists. Uh, this is actually for, from around the world who have received foundation research grants in recent years. Respondents express near consensus on the impact that funding sources play in their field. 94% agreed that a lack of federal funding for brain and eye disease research is impeding discoveries. 91% agreed that lack of research funding is driving scientists from the field completely. 96% identified limited funding as a top barrier to entry for new scientists in the field of brain and eye disease research. So, you know, um, 
it, it, you have all these these people who have been training, uh, dedicating their own resources to getting educated, largely, right? And then they get to the point where mm -hmm. they're ready to be on the front lines of science, and there's no science getting done. That's just completely ridiculous. What a waste of resources. Uh, the, the total U.S. health care cost of Alzheimer's alone is nearly $200 billion, $200 billion annually, and is expected to soar to $1.1 trillion per year by the time we get to 2050. Uh, if we don't have scientific discoveries made possible by research funding, this is where we're heading. You know, sometimes the, you got to let the people doing the math uh, take the lead, right? You got, sometimes the number crunchers can point out some very important um, things that math shows, which is if we're going to be spending, you know, uh, 40, less than 40 years from now, we're going to be spending a trillion dollars a year due to Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, a uh, a few dollars more, a few billion, a couple hundred billion invested now could save trillions down the road. It only makes sense that you would put that money in there ASAP. But unfortunately, yep. the number crunchers. And the scientists no, no, you know, aren't it's yet the, ruling it's the world. The do more with less philosophy. Yeah, we, we want to encourage you to continue with your research. We just, you know, there's not going to be a lab. Or you're going to have to do it out of your garage and without all the equipment necessary. It's just going to be, just be plucky about it. Pull yourself up by your lab straps, young man. Yeah, no. That's right. Not. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. I have a story about genes for cold, surviving the, surviving the cold. And while I was in Japan, it was rather chilly, and uh, I, don't, I guess I don't have these genes that they've been finding in people in Siberia because I had to go buy a coat because I didn't pack appropriately. Oh, dear. Anyway, uh, Siberia is a massive area occupying about 10% of Earth's land mass and uh, has about 0.5% of the world's population according to uh, Science Now, their uh, science magazine's online news website. There's a study, however, that uh, it hasn't been published yet but has been reported at a, uh, at a scientific meeting recently that it's at a meeting called Unraveling Human Origins. So following where people have come from, a bunch of evolutionary stuff. Um, a researcher named Cardona and, uh, let's see, yes, a researcher named Cardona, she's a graduate student, Alexia Cardona, um, from the University of Cambridge. She analyzed 200 DNA samples that were collected at the Institute of Biological Problems of the North in Madagan, Russia. I find it really interesting that they have an Institute of Biological Problems of the North. I don't know if that's just a translation issue, <laughs> but it just makes me giggle a little bit. Um, so she analyzed uh, 200 DNA samples hoping to find genes that help humans adapt to the cold. And so she specifically looked for evidence of selection, natural selection on specific genes, uh, leading to the, uh, their increase in frequency within a population. So how many individuals have particular uh, forms or alleles of the gene within, a, within uh, various populations. And uh, interestingly, there are these, uh, among the, gr the people, the DNA samples that she looked at, there were different groups of people. So um, northern Siberia or maybe eastern, western Siberia, depending on where, where they were from, they actually found some differences. There were three genes in all that uh, were found to be uh, very special. PRKG1 is one of them. It was involved in the contraction of smooth muscle. Smooth muscle 
is the muscle uh, that lines your gut. It's also uh, it's also part of your blood vessels, your arteries, allowing them to contract uh, or constrict. And additionally, it, there are a bunch of other places that smooth muscle pops up in the body, but because of its locations, uh, it is involved in shivering, the constriction of blood vessels, so heat production, and the minimization of heat loss. Another gene is called ENPP7, and it's implicated in the metabolism of fats, uh, so specifically those in meat and dairy which are uh, staples of these of Siberian people. Additionally, UCP1 uh, is the, and the UC, UCP1 is the is the large allele from which these two genes became variations. So ENP, ENPP7 and PRKG1 kind of ver, uh, mutated and became what they are from uh, UCP1. Um, so it's a, uh, what else does UCP1 do? Um, UCP1 uh, helps the body fat stores oh, create non-shivering thermogenesis, which is uh, it mm. increases brown fat, which is used to, uh, when you burn brown fat, it goes immediately to heat production as opposed to producing chemical energy for your body to use. So instead of going to your metabolism and keeping your body running, it just goes to create heat. And we, uh, we know that lots of animals like bears and uh, other hibernating animals and those that uh, live in very cold climates have a lot of brown fat. Well, it turns out different populations of humans now also have different amounts uh, or abilities to create different amounts of brown fat. Um, so it's really interesting that they found these specific genes within these specific populations that exist in the very cold climates and they don't exist at such frequencies compared to other groups of people. Um, uh, another researcher who heard about the study says that uh, that the results are fascinating. Uh, they add to evidence that we have continued to evolve in our modern world and they are uh, the research is consistent with uh, another research team's earlier work finding signs of natural selection in sets of genes and not just single ones. So uh, there's a question now whether or not if we look at Native Americans, Siberians are supposed to be the source populations for Native Americans. So if we analyze Native American populations, maybe we'll find evidence of, um, of uh, gene selection as uh, populations move from Siberia to North America. Um, additionally, Neanderthals and Denisovans may have these genes as well. So how far mm -hmm. back do they go? So these cold mm -hmm. genes can tell a really interesting story about human migration. Wow. Yeah, this is definitely one to follow. We'll put this in the, uh, yeah. let's see where it leads next file for sure. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. Totally off the subject, but when you said the translation issue of the biological problems of the North, it, it reminded me <laughs> of this, uh, this video I saw on YouTube where they took uh, the theme song from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air right, and oh, they put it into Google Translate and back into English. And they did it with every single language, right? every single language on on the Google Translate back and forth again until uh, the song turned into economic problems mama I bring fear she speaks I have nothing it was like the it came out of like completely <laughs> just <laughs> had no correlation Garbled. to the story that was told uh, yeah. in the first place it was that bad <laughs> I love it. I love it. I like how uh, right Justin. before you started the well, cold story, I bundled up because I'm freezing. <laughs> she wasn't even realizing how cold she was until we started talking about that story. And she's like, oh, yeah. Oh, I should do something about being cold. It's, right. It was the power of suggestion before I even started talking. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I will tell you. 
It's a mental link through Google+. And that's Plus. right. And mental Northern link. California is having that's freaking science. spring weather. There are blossoms Ooh. on trees right now. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's raining yeah. here. Chucking. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Blair, you had a story that you wanted to talk about uh, sure. with science finger wrinkles. We've talked about this before, um, that it's not water saturation that's wrinkling right. your fingers, but a right. nervous system response that's causing mm -hmm. pickling. Which, no matter how many times what's I hear what's it, new about this study? it blows me away. So they know yeah. it's a nervous system response, but now they know what the use is, which once you hear about it, it seems very obvious. Uh, now, wait a sec. Wait a sec. Can I guess without having yes. heard it before? I would guess it's from, uh, was, was it didn't always exist uh, in humans, but came about as an evolutionary uh, trait sometime in the days in the northern Africa when we were eating lots of uh, clams. And clams. <laughs> or whatever uh, shellfish was available uh, on the on the shores, and had our hands in the water a lot of the time, and it mm -hmm. made it uh, useful to have better grip underwater. Right. So you're essentially correct. It's for grip. Yes. Yeah. Not on the history so, evolutionarily, but uh, mm -hmm. at least uh, they don't know. I don't think they know when like it started or what it was that they were grabbing for, but uh, the Institute of Neuroscience at Newcastle University tested human volunteers in, with what they call creased and uncreased fingers. So they had some people immerse their hands in warm water for 30 minutes, and those were much faster than those with dry hands. Uh, in picking up glass marbles and leading fishing weights between their thumbs and index fingers. And so the wrinkled fingers definitely give a better grip in wet conditions. Okay. So the cool. question is, uh, does, now I don't know this, and I think we should know this by now. This must have been figured out. Does this happen in chimpanzee hands or orangutan hands? That would I don't be know. interesting to find out. I have no idea. Free yeah, thesis. Do their free thesis through. right there. Evolutionary, um, uh, who's got it, who doesn't. What's really interesting here, too, is that they said that they also found, they tested and found that wrinkling of the fingers had no adverse impact on handling of dry objects, which makes us wonder why we don't just permanently have creased fingers and toes. Right. Well, it made no difference on dry huh. items. Is that right. Reason? Yeah. Yes. So, so that's most of the time why we wouldn't really need it. Only when we were dealing with... Except species. it had no adverse impact, which means it would be advantageous for us to just immediately have the wrinkled hands instead of having to wait around in the water. Gotcha. Unless, but, unless there's the possibility of uh, decreased sensitivity. So maybe mm. it has nothing to do with grip, but maybe there is some aspect of our sensory system that mm. is affected by the wrinkliness, right. by the pruning. Um, right. I mean, and Definitely. you know, they say no, no effect on it whatsoever. So maybe it's not that it's no effect; it's that it's no effect in the areas on which we tested it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But so, so this is this in some stuff. ways it's kind of a well duh thing. Naturally, yes, it helps with grip. That makes perfect sense. What's still confusing to me is why one day if I take a 20-minute shower, it happens, and the next day, it doesn't. Why does sometimes, why do my fingers right. wrinkle, and sometimes they don't? And other times not. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Tell me, question. Kiki, why? I don't know. Your brain is making decisions <laughs> for you. Yeah. Uh. I know it's, it's the, frightening. So, yeah, yeah, so it's a nervous system response. But mm -hmm. what indicates to the nervous system wrinkle or don't wrinkle? What is telling your nervous system that? There has mm -hmm. to be something. Mm -hmm. But it's not for yeah. you to know. You're only existing as the consciousness portion of your brain on a need-to-know basis. Uh, you it's aren't... science. <laughs> I need to know everything. But, I mean, your brain That's isn't telling you. Yeah, you. You can go out and learn it. This is what we're trying to do here. But, yeah, your brain doesn't need to tell you. It's like, yeah, no, the conscious uh, ape does not need to know this. I'm just not going to tell. Yeah, it's... Uh... We could... I, 
identity four says uh, now he needs to keep a finger wrinkling log. I mean, maybe mm. there's some kind of shower notebook that we can all start and compare yeah. notes. <laughs> Does it? Is it <laughs> depend on where you're Which really. day did you get wrinkly? Which day is not? What are the conditions? What was I'm different? Water I'm hotter, predicting. colder. <laughs> Because you have a lot of hair, but I'm sure you don't wash your hair every time. You don't shampoo every time you shower, right? Mm -hmm. right? So maybe your brain knows which times you're planning on showering your hair, and it wrinkles up so you can handle the, the bottle, the shampoo bottle. And doesn't Justin, on the you don't day. wash your hair every time that you... No. Everyone does that. You don't do that? That's gross. No, it's no, not gross. You'd be destroying your hair if you <laughs> use shampoo on it every time. It's fine. We were talking yeah, uh, last month, I think, about my like, yeah, my fear, my phobia of people who don't oh, shower. Keeps you out. <laughs> yeah. Non-showering. Well, I'm keep actually, you out. actually then I, I'm, I will say, tell you, I'm yeah. afraid of people who shower too often because you know, gosh knows what kind of micro any any my, uh, body microbes that are lingering around and like, you're just gonna pick up whatever's out there. Whereas I like to keep uh, the bacteria <laughs> I know. And... <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. It's probiotic non-bathing. You haven't heard it's like the rage in California since you left. Nobody here in California is bathing anymore. God. It's it's uh, it's been going on now for about a month, and it's uh, okay. I'm gonna yeah. stay here. I only shower <laughs> like that. once a week. I do wash my hair then, but I'm kidding. Mm. There are several more showers. Actually, there. I almost never shower. It's true. I think I'm exposed to plenty of bacteria in my profession. I'm not too worried about it. I think people who shower are just rinsing. I think people who take baths are doing the deep cleaning. <laughs> okay. Well, this is a whole nother situation. But anyway, this is this is a whole nother conversation too. Um, we are almost. We are basically at the end of the hour. But I have a quick story related to a story that Justin brought up a few weeks ago about ion channels and how we hear. So Justin uh, relayed a story about uh, physiologists determining a specific ion channel that uh, is activated and allows, it's a G protein coupled uh, ion channel that allows the flow of ion ions across the cell membrane to create an electrical charge that can be carried into the brain and, uh, and interpreted as sound. Um, this particular ion channel uh, is from a gene called TMC1, and it was found according to a study published in the journal Nature, it was found in a worm. It was found what? in a nematode, a little, a little tiny nematode. And so TMC1, which is used in human ears to allow us to hear, is a protein that appears to aid in sensing and avoiding high concentrations of salt in these nematodes. Um, yeah, so it's a, a neuro, neurobiologist at Harvard University, Jeffrey Holt, says this work is a really important paper for the hearing field as well uh, because it suggests that TMC1 can act as an ion channel and that it may work similarly in the mammalian auditory system. So this is adding more data to the ion channel, this is how it works, uh, idea of hearing. Um, so they've, they know, they've worked with nematodes before showing that they can sense low salt concentrations relying on uh, cyclic GMP uh, and other sodium ion channels and um, nobody really knew how ne nematodes were able to avoid high concentrations of salt. And so these researchers at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in the UK and Korea University College of Medicine uh, elucidated TMC1's role in salt sensation uh, while they were looking at its function in mechanosensation. So they, uh, they found that the nematode, they knew it was involved in pressure sensing. So if you touch or poke the nematode, that the nematode would turn away or move away from that. And that it was, in, that that involved physical activation of the TMC1 ion channel. 
and or the the TMC genes, and then they ended up finding that it also had this role in salt. So kind of salt. Uh, it was a very interesting side thing that they found that could have influences on how we look at our own ears. I've never been able to to, to look at my own ear. I've tried. <laughs> I know it's kind of hard unless you have a mirror. Even with a mirror, it's really like you have to have like a bunch of mirrors, and then it gets confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Did I have what was the last story that I wanted? I think that was. I think that was all these stories. Justin, did you have anything else before we get going? Oh my goodness. Well, we could just uh, let's see. We have the brain, the brain dreamer. We did that. Oh yeah, there's a new material that they're looking to put on ships. Uh, that they can, uh, material that can wrinkle, <laughs> change its surface in response to a stimulus such as stretching or pressure or, in this case, they're going to use electricity. Basically, they would have this material on the outside of, for instance, ships that collect a lot of barnacles. They could flip the switch. Electricity runs through this thin material on the surface of the boat, changing the structure, and uh, theoretically, barnacles would just go popping off. So as opposed to spending you know, a week or several days in port with people actually going around scrubbing and power washing and chiseling barnacles and muscles and stuff off of the off of the ship. They could hit a switch. The actual physical mm-hmm. outside it would be it would be like the finger. It'd be like uh you know, uh, it would give it the whole entire ship a, a wrinkly finger and the barnacles would go away. That's neat. I feel like that would get rid of a lot of them, but not all of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, but you get it. I mean, have you ever seen, if you've ever watched uh, them, uh, have to, it was like on one of those um, non Discovery Channel shows, the uh, Dirty Jobs, I think it was, where they showed what is involved and like they're like chiseling and hammering. It's like this huge thing to get some of these barnacles on. They're really good. Uh, but yeah, this might be a way to, for them to like the actual physical surface of the ship and knock them off. That would be cool. awesome. And if you can get rid of other stuff as well, not just the barnacles, but mm. um, algae and other grasses and things. All like hitchhiking that species. I mean, mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the hitchhikers. That could be, that could be great. I know, I know a bunch of sailors who would probably racing sailors who would probably appreciate this technology, although mm-hmm. it might be a little bit too costly for the average sailor. Yeah. Well, you know, all of these technologies, of course, are uh, completely insanely expensive until they get put into mass production and they become cheaper and cheaper, uh, like hybrid vehicles. Right now, the, the uh, you know, the first uh, hydrogen uh, power fuel cell vehicles are out there, you know, you really look at them and they cost, you know, 20 million a piece, <laughs> something ridiculous. But if they made, you know, a couple million of them, it would come down to pretty rational, reasonable vehicle prices. It's just getting that ramp up from the beginning. It's like the old story of penicillin. When penicillin came out first, it was something ridiculous, like $10,000 a pill. And within the course of about three years, they brought that down to 10 cents just by manufacturing process. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, we have definitely hit the end of our hour, so I just want to let people know that next week we'll be back again on Google+, and hopefully I will get us on the right channel. I will not listen to the lies that it tells me again. Mm. Uh, And it also broadcasts to YouTube Live, so you can find us on our This Week in Science channel or on YouTube Live. And uh, hopefully you can also follow Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus where announcements go out uh, to be able to find the link to the show if things seem a little confusing. But anyway, shout outs to Blair. To Blair? Wait, you can't shout out to Blair. To Blair. To Blair's always, she's, to you can't Blair. shout her out. She's always, shout, shout out to Rebar for okay. coming okay. up with okay. the amazing okay. Blair. Shout out to Rebar. Yes. Uh, shout out to Rebar. Super rad. Yes, awesome. Uh Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Awesome. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just search for 
uh, This Week in Science in the iTunes directory, or if you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid app in the Android Marketplace or Twist, T-W-I-S, in the iTunes uh, Marketplace on your iPhone thingy. For more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available on our website, twist.org. And we also want to hear from you, so send us an email, Kirsten at this week Kirsten at this week in science dot com. Or twistminion at twistminion at gmail.com because I don't have the I lost the other email. So if you've got something to send me, yeah, make Blair sure. Baz at gmail as well. Yeah. Uh, you can also contact us on the Twitter at Dr. Kiki or at Jackson Fly. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a haiku that came to you a dream, a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week. We hope that you'll join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say if you've learned anything from the words that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 science. science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. Mm-hmm. <laughs> dirty socks. I had dirty toe socks. Ooh. Okay, so we have a month, 25 days until you come back. Mm hmm. That's pretty awesome. I'm going to try to do the show from wherever I am. Every hotel I've booked so far has um, 
Wireless. Ugh. Has wireless, so yeah, I good. should be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So when do you start traveling again? Sunday. Um, starting Sunday, I'm traveling Israel. Um, so I'll be back in Jerusalem, but in a hotel next week for the show. <laughs> um, and then I'm well, going to Italy. Anymore. Yeah. And I'm going to Italy, but then I think I'll be in France for the second one. And then I'll be in London for the one after that. And then I'll be home. Wow. Yay! That's so soon. In London, though, it'll be like so 3 o'clock in the morning when the show starts. <laughs> That'll be fun. Well, you either stay up. Yeah, you either you either stay up until 3 a.m. I think that would be the way to do it. Maybe. We'll see. Because 5 a.m. you wake up for. Yeah, or mm -hmm. you just say, screw you guys. I'm staying no, I don't think I'm doing that. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. I'm staying with a friend, and she has. She said she has a room that I can have all to myself for the podcast. <laughs> I love the chat room. You get a podcast room. Yeah. What are you laughing Let's at? See. Uh, I've got my email back, thanks to uh, <laughs> Aaron Laura from the chat room. Is that all you were missing? Yeah, and you kept, I kept asking you for it, and you're like, I don't know, it gets bumped to my Gmail. I never go to that thing. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I just all. couldn't believe it was so simple. That was it. That, that, that was it. That, that was all. It was a I link. Just, I didn't know what it was that we had to go to. Did because it was all on the other computer, like Yay, before. I just Lord. hit the button, and then it was. Well, there. Also, then, someone told me that our website is down. The twist.org site is down. Man, what's up with that? I meant to. I was yeah, going to. Something fix happened. I didn't know how. I got people to. It's been fixed. It's now fixed. Oh. Sweet. Apache was off for some reason. The server uh, does when this. Why is it fixed? Because no I, I tried I it no this morning. Why. It was just fixed, like right. Oh. Like maybe. Two hours ago. Great. Maybe three hours ago. Yeah. Tov me'od. Yeah, Arlo, I don't know when it happened, but I know that today when I was trying to access the site, it was down, and I got an email from somebody yesterday or the day before about it being down. So, yeah. Oh, backup recordings. Um, Identity 4, yes, please send me the backup recording just in case mine does not come out well. That would be awesome. <laughs> so I lost one of the recordings. I mean, I've had to like get the recordings off of YouTube. I lost one of the recordings because I forgot to stop recording and it recorded overnight. So I had like 16 hours oh, wow. <laughs> of an audio file. Yeah, my computer was just like, yeah, screw you. <laughs> no, I'm not doing this. I didn't sign up for this. This isn't anywhere in the material, in the brochure, mm -hmm. the, the, what I signed up for. It's, I, I never promised this. This is too much. You're out of your mind. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> tough. I'm not quite in my email yet. It's still trying to open it because it's now a few months of filtering. Filtering, thinking. Filter, filter, filter. Considering. Spam needs to filter. Get the spam filter away. Well, it's really amazing that that uh, that webmail program because it it lets in every piece of spam, even spam I don't think that was addressed to me. It 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 downloads all of it and shows you all of it first, and then the filter kicks in like a little bit later, and so. Yeah, I have 25,000 uh, in my inbox. Wow. <laughs> okay, awesome. so um, I love you guys, but I got to go. Why? If I have to go us, wait in line at the no. post office. If you love us, you wouldn't leave us. It's just not, this, these two things do not compute. If I could take you with me to the post office, I would, but I can't. <sighs> the sun's I would, up. I would I go with your you. face I'd now. 
the sun is up and I have to go wait in line at the post office because it's Friday so um, at about noon today the post office closes and it won't be open again until I'm gone so it's my last chance do it yes and go today is when everyone goes so I have to go when it opens or I'll be there for hours mm. sure right. bot Get out of here. <laughs> okay <laughs> Shabbat. Right. <laughs> it's my last Shabbat in Israel. Your last Shabbat Aww. before you ship out? That's yes. Than that. Very nice. But I thought you might like it because it's really early and you haven't slept. So I figured you'd. <laughs> 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 it's too bad because I feel like my humor would actually work on you right now. <laughs> It would. <laughs> Perfect time to try out all those jokes that haven't uh, ever worked before. Right. <laughs> okay, you have before, ten seconds. Maybe to go. It'll work now. Uh, what do you call two bananas on the ground? What? A pair of slippers. <laughs> 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 At no other time is this funny. This is not, it's not even a good joke. <laughs> uh, I like it. <laughs> Pair of slippers. It's funny now. It's funny now. <laughs> okay, one more, and then I have to leave. I don't think that was it. That's all. My my daughter oh. taught me that one actually this morning. Mm. I, I learned this joke. Is. Hold on, I have to take my blanket off. What is this? Oh. Hmm. Uh, angry teapot. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a seagull coming back from the library. <laughs> <laughs> Awesomeness. <laughs> oh, I, that's good. Uh, okay. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I'm out. Go good night, fly everybody. Yourself. Go fly yourself to the post office. I will. Little I'll go miss. walk in the rain with a giant uh, box instead. I have to go to a farther one because the close one's not open. Oh, and if it's raining, it's raining there? It's pouring. Walk really fast, oh. you'll get less wet. Yes, <laughs> that's how physics works. <laughs> no, it is. It's true. The faster you go, the less wet. I think you'll I get. learned that on Futurama. Yes, I think it's just you're less wet because you're literally in the rain for less time. Exactly, exactly. Because the amount of mm -hmm. raindrops you encounter moving forward is all the same, regardless of yeah. what speed you're going. And so the amount that's coming down on top of your head is going to be the same as well. It's just a matter of how long you're right. doing that. Yes. I'm going to walk fast. Run! Run! Go walk fast. And wear uh, shoes with like good traction. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing hiking boots. Perfect. Okay. See you guys later. Bye. Ball of mystery. Goodbye. See you next week. Bye. <laughs> Pew. Pew. And she's gone. And she's out. Yeah. Welcome back from Japan. This is we need to take this. I mean, the the show now is truly an international show. We've been in the past had guests from Australia and truly. Britain and you know other places. Now we've got live broadcast from Japan. We've got it from Israel. We may have uh, what Jerusalem, uh, France yeah. coming up next. I think this is huge. Oh yeah. The show She's has traveling. gone completely. London. Global. Oh Russia. We had you in Moscow. Kiki, Dr. Kiki live from Moscow. Go, That's right. I, I, yeah. yeah, I did broadcast from Russia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From Tambov. Tambovskaya. Tambov. Yeah. International science of mystery. I think at the time... I was trying to, uh, over the radio, it was kind of tough. I was trying to find out which one of the students you were talking to there would make a good mail order ride. <laughs> I think, I don't know what happened. I somehow, the show turned into me interviewing your students. <laughs> like, what? Oh, yeah. yeah That's it right. was like really random. I remember that. I don't know what happened. It was like. <laughs> I was like, what have they done with Kiki? Okay, I'm meeting more students. It was fun, though. It was good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was something with our with our connection and the audio, or I don't know. I don't remember, but it was funny. Yeah. 
So we've really we've circumvented the globe with this show. Um, okay, uh, this might be off air talk, but maybe not. Maybe not. So I told you last week or week before, whenever that was, that I talked to that guy who was a creative uh, vice president at KVIE Public Television. Um, one of the yeah. things he was telling me is that uh, KQED. Is it KQ, I think it's yeah. KQED is trying to ramp up its sciencey broadcasting ness mm -hmm. with original broadcasting. Do we do we, how, do we not do we know anybody over there yet? Do we have a contact over there? Well, yeah. I mean, I at, at KQED here in San Francisco, I know a couple of people. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, this was this guy from uh, Sacramento. He's Sacramento. He's KVAE. He's television, public broadcasting. But mm -hmm. apparently, the, the public broadcasting people all know each other. <laughs> I don't know. Somehow, yeah. they all hang yeah, out at the do. same. <laughs> yeah, they do. Wine tasting room in Napa or something. I don't know what they do. Um, but uh, he uh, his suggestion was, you know, if we're already doing a radio show. Um, the most logical thing for us to do would be to go there where they're trying to ramp up sciencey stuff with their quest program or something like that. So uh, we should hit them up. We should hit them up for a studio time slot space thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know exactly what they're looking for. Um, us. They're looking for what we have. Maybe if... Yeah, so do you have his contact information? His, yeah, I, I did. Like um, email, phone was, number? Yeah, it was on that card that was here somewhere. You... I don't know, that's my card. Okay, so if you find the card, um, yeah. find the card, send me his contact information in an email, and then I can send an inquiry email to him. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll copy you on it. K-V-I-E. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, he also said, you know, um, high production value, but uh, two-minute bits they're constantly looking for. Because in his words, we play a lot of, what did he say? Something along the lines of, they play a lot of kind of um, the static community calendar update things between shows, which is fine, but they have mm -hmm. to do a lot of them because their shows typically run 25 minutes or, you know, 55 minutes. And this is the TV, the KVIE TV, not radio. television. Yeah, it's television. Um, yeah, okay. So that's why, okay. yeah. Um, he's saying if we did uh, two minute high production value segments, that again, this is probably a for free thing at first, but uh, that they would very likely get airtime well, because they're would... looking for filler. And that's how you eventually could get a show is if they said, hey, you know what? Wouldn't that be great as something we could turn into a full yeah. half hour, 25 minute show? Then it would come with funding. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's one thing to say, two minute bits, high production value, blah 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 blah. But I mean, that takes work to do, and it's not the kind of thing that it just happens. <laughs> it happens, you know, with not a lot of effort. So right. yeah, but Dale says everyone wants free. I I cannot do something like that for free. I know. I know how much time and effort goes into making something that's high production yeah. value, good audio, good video, uh, with graphics, music, you know, all that kind of stuff. Even music, we got, we got musical it's, minions, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's, but it's, it, it's time and effort and money, and even if you make it into something that is a repeatable, uh, repeatable recipe, mm -hmm. uh, you're still at, I mean... I would say at least a full day's worth of work, at yeah. least, to get, yeah, to get something a, out. It's just a yeah. thing. Television is kind of hard. I would much yeah. rather do radio, anyway. I like, it, yeah, I like radio, too. Because um, it's live. If, you know, I, if you send me that information, I, I can inquire what kind of stuff they're looking for and find out, you know, you know, if they can pay for anything, mm. um, you know, it could, I mean, if, 
if they don't need super high quality, we can take it from the show. <laughs> right. No, he he was like he was like it, it can't be community access. It's got to be you know. Television's tough, kid. It's like a thousand dollars a minute to produce even you know, basic show. It's, it's. I don't even know how we do it. It's really. I, I don't know why. It is a thousand dollars a minute. Yeah, and even so like low, low, with with doing high production value but low cost. Yeah, it's a thousand dollars a minute. Yeah, and you know you look at you look at some of the successful shows uh, where they go around and it's just a person talking with the background. You still got the camera guy, the sound guy, the editing folks. It's there's a lot of hours that go into it, so yeah, I can make sure. I mean, I can I can see why it's that expensive, but um, what we need is not the KVIE but the KQED contact because I'm thinking you know. Uh, getting a widely listened to uh, radio on the air on a widely listened to radio station like that would be awesome, Nasty. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. Plus, I think we'd get free parking yeah. in the city. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think. I mean, this is yeah, really park, park KQED. We get a parking it's spot, free. right? Oh, well, we have to share one? Okay. Oh, great. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's CTV? Yeah, send me that info. That's a place to start. What's uh, is that community TV? What is a coffee television? Wait, no, Dale. What's CTV? The Canadian Television Network. Oh, China TV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Iron Lore says China. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can picture me on I can picture me on uh, uh, Chinese TV. television. You know my opinion on. Yeah, you know, the thing I was thinking the other day is if you have noticed how this is be getting censored constantly. And for Connecticut, yeah, San Francisco parking might cost a thousand dollars a minute. They did. Uh, I've heard that there's this new like. When you go into the parking places, if you have a truck, it's like an extra forty bucks to park or something ridiculous. Yeah, what? like there's all kinds of kooky extra the Science Island Broadcast Network. Yeah, we're gonna put towers. We're gonna we're gonna have huge towers on Science Island. <laughs> we're gonna let uh, every cell phone company have that rural area to tower there for free. And we're gonna sneak our radio tower on on top of it. It'll be a combo deal. Mm. Wow, I'm still updating this. I'm trying to get through. Everyone wants me to play something. What is it? Down to twenty two thousand new. <laughs> Oh, this is intriguing. All right. I can't play it right now. I can't play it because it's somebody else's. But maybe Justin can play the link himself. What link is it? Where is it? What is it in the? Arn lore towards the bottom of the chat. It's gotcha. a YouTube link for a hypnotoad thing for you. <gasps> Thank you, Dale. I gotta get through the uh, advertisement first, and oh my God! Oh, there it is. Ooh, the Ten hour hypnotoad. I think I'm gonna <laughs> put it on loop. Put it on repeat. He's getting hypnotized now. Oh dear. Oh dear. Okay. I well, I know what I'm doing for the evening. I'll just leave you with Justin hypnotized. <laughs> I, I know. I know what. I know what I'm doing for the rest of my evening. Watching the hypnotoad. Yeah, that's gonna be my. That's gonna be my evening. <laughs> Ten hours will take me right into okay. seven thirty in the morning. Perfect. That's exactly when I have to be up. <laughs> Nothing special about it. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 
Um, okay, I'm going to head out. And um, tomorrow, science chat, noon Pacific time. Oh, red uh, green for shows. anyone awesome. who wants to join me over on Justin TV, um, that could be fun to do. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to try and be awake by then. We're working on the jet lag. We're working through it. There was a panda squirrel in our chat room. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Panda squirrel. That was somebody just poking at Blair. Poking the Blair button. All right, Justin. Have fun with the Hypnotoad. Everybody out there, it was fun. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm sorry I uh, messed up with the linking and everything and made things difficult for all y'all. But G+, Google Plus told me that it would play in both places, on This Week in Science yeah. and my page, and it obviously did not. Didn't it? So next week I will do the more complicated, didn't log into something else. No, 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 no. We'll make it work. <laughs> it will come out okay in the end. I promise. Um, yeah. Have a good night, everybody. Good night, Kiki. See you good night, later. minions. See you good next night. week. I'll send you that email. Ah. You get it in a few minutes.